<laughs> well, now for something completely different, as they say. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I thought it might be interesting to look at some of the great councils of the church. We've all heard of uh, Vatican II, Second Vatican Council. Well, that was the 21st of the general or ecumenical councils that have been held in the course of the history of the church. Some of those councils are more significant than others. Uh, and some of them are very significant indeed and have uh, shaped the Christian faith and the life of the church in very decisive ways. So I thought we might just look at, at some of those. And r rather than launching into a, a great thing about what an ecumenical council is, I thought we'd just uh, begin straight off with the Council of Nicaea, which was the first one. Nicaea um, is a place, in, nowadays it would be Western Turkey, I think that's right, um, Western Turkey. It, in, in those days it, it was in the province of Bithynia. So it was held uh, in the year 325, that's quite uh, significant, and it was summoned by uh, not by the Pope or any bishops, but by the Emperor of the time, the famous Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian Emperor. And it is, it, it's, it was a, a highly significant event. It was actually, I, I couldn't find in the material I had when it actually ended, but it, it didn't take very long. Uh, it was just one or two months, as far as I can see, often medical councils drag on for years and years, but this one was quite brisk uh, and businesslike. But it is highly significant as the first ecumenical council in the history of the church, so the first gathering of bishops from all over the Christian world. It's all, so that is significant in that way. It's significant, secondly, for settling the controversy caused by the views of Arius. Have you heard of Arius? Right, A-R-I-U-S. And uh, his views of who Christ was were rejected by the council and it affirmed very strongly the divinity of Christ and uh, did so in the form of a creed which is still used today. So we'll come go into that in more detail. And lastly, it, it's uh, famous for settling the date of Easter. Um, I mean, not, not, not in the sense that we have a particular day, but this, the Christian way of calculating Easter, locating it on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. That's when Easter is. <laughs> and though that's not spelled out by the Council of Nicaea, that it laid the ground for that becoming the universal practice. There had been other practices um, in, in the church. Now it represents the church emerging from its previous history of constraint and periodic persecutions. So from, say, that well, the time of the Apostles or a little after the time of the Apostles, right through until the beginning of the fourth century within the Roman Empire, which was where most of the church was. The, the church did exist outside the Roman Empire, but most of it was within the Roman Empire, which was huge, going all the way from um, southern Scotland to to uh, the, the border with, well, modern, I suppose, modern Iraq, really, uh, that covering, covering a vast area. And uh, it, the, the, the church had, had been, in a certain sense, in the catacombs, we say, that's slightly melodramatic, but the church had, uh, had not been able to function freely and securely and publicly and visibly, but now, uh, thanks to the, the 
conversion of the emperor and, and uh, the end of the period of persecution, the church was able to do that. And this, the fact that the council could be held was a great sign and expression of that. Now, at the time, uh, apparently, I mean, this is rather astonishing, uh, there the were about 1,800 bishops, uh, which seems a huge amount to me, but anyway, uh, that, that there's, that there's a lot. A lot of the dioceses, as still in Italy and Greece, were very small. You were just the bishop of one little place, you know, really, and, and the villages around. And, um, but not all those bishops participated, probably about one-seventh of the number, but all the bishops were invited and the emperor said, you can travel free, your travel costs will be covered, uh, and your lodging will be free, and you can bring uh, two priests and three deacons. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, so there were bishops from all over who did come uh, all over the Roman world except Britain. Nobody came from Britain. <laughs> uh, most of the bishops would have been from the eastern end. And about uh, 250 or so, but the traditional number is 318. That there were 318 bishops at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, Athanasius said he counted them and then but uh, not everybody agrees with this and it's often said that, that the the number 318 was symbolic and therefore can't be taken too seriously because in the book of Genesis chapter 14 you may remember Abraham goes on a uh, a campaign has a, has a, has a little a little war and he has 318 uh, people with him. Uh, and so that's the connection. But it's often called, you, it, when you see, there are, in the Eastern churches, there are icons. I mean, if, you know, if I was high tech and all prepared, we'd have a lovely icon of the Council of Nicaea hanging up. I'm sure they can be found, yes, uh, on, on a mobile phone. Oh, I see, sorry, you're just eating peanuts. But sorry, I thought you were, I thought you were reaching for, for your... <laughs> so you were reaching for your mobile phone. <laughs> but anyway, if you, if you see an icon of the Council of Nicaea, if it's, if it's uh, the full thing, it's got 318 bishops there. <laughs> um, now, the Saint, um, Saint Athanasius, the famous Saint Athanasius, who really rose to fame afterwards mainly, but he was present as a deacon. He was the deacon of the Archbishop of Alexandria. And uh, the, there were quite a number of sort of famous people there of the time. Uh, one person who was probably there uh, is, is um, now the, the, the patron saint of Aberdeen. Tell me, you know who the patron saint of Aberdeen is? Yes, yeah, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas of, of Myra, or later of Bari, as it's called, um, and, and the origin of Santa Claus. Uh, he, was, he was actually there, and he is supposed to have uh, slapped Arius across the face, in the face. But then people said, well, they're not sure that actually Arius was there, because Arius wasn't a bishop, or was there as a... He wouldn't have been in the formal sessions, so we don't know, don't know. Anyway, um, well, you can't talk about the Council of Nicaea uh, without talking about the figure of Arius and, and the heresy that takes its name from him, Arianism. Uh, he was, well, I suppose you, you'd have to say he was an African because he was born in North Africa, born in Libya. We don't know exactly when. And he became a parish priest in Alexandria, which was a great city and uh, a, a great Christian center. And from about the year 319, so this is six years before the, the council, he began to put forward 
his his own ideas uh, and uh, they're what would be called in general subordinationist subordinationist which is saying that the son God the son is subordinate to God the father and uh, the, his bishop uh, who, who was at Alexander is that right Alexander of Alexander um, took a, a strong line against him and uh, a conflict erupted Arius was uh, a, a popular preacher and we we don't have probably because it was destroyed we don't have much material actually from him very little but he he is supposed to have put his views into into songs hymns really which were which had nice catchy tunes and were taken up by the people so he got all the people singing his songs uh, which were theologically a little bit iffy and but some people say that this this uh, had a great development on on uh, caused a great rise in in the use of hymns in church which hadn't been terribly popular beforehand but but so the people who were as it were orthodox against Arius thought well we better try and have some good hymns as well to get the people singing on on our side and and uh, in the west that's particularly true of St Ambrose he he was he was doing that now um, what what did he what did he say Arius this may all seem but I hope by the end we'll realize it's not this may all seem you know very long ago and not very relevant and so on but it, it is actually relevant and now in in the New Testament generally when you have the word God it refers to he who we would call the first person of the Trinity it refers to God the Father Jesus is called God a few times a few times but usually the word God when you just find the word God you, with the definite article so it is the God in Greek refers to God the Father and Arius maintained that only the Father the first person we would say of the Trinity but he wouldn't have said that only the Father was God in the true sense um, because and he didn't have an origin from anything else he was unoriginate he was just there from all eternity so who was Christ or who who is the son of God and he was now we're talking here you in a, in a certain sense you you abstract from the incarnation we're talking about uh, the, the son of God independently of his incarnation or in his pre-existent state before in inverted commas he became incarnate does that make sense okay uh, and Arius said he was created by the father and therefore had a beginning in time he liked very much the phrase used of Christ in Colossians 1.15 he was the firstborn of all creation so firstborn of all creation so part of creation okay and there's a, a, a line in the book of Proverbs chapter 8 verse 22 where wisdom is speaking and it says the Lord created me at the beginning of his ways now it was traditional to identify wisdom with Christ so there it was and then did not Jesus say in the Gospel of John the father is greater than I 
So these were the texts that Arius latched onto, shall we say. Now the sun was unique in that he was created before everything else. So he was the, the first production of God, as it were. And it was through him that God created everything else. So he's the mediator of creation. So he, he's, he's transcendent to the rest of creation. And so he could be called God, if you like, with a small g, but in a secondary sense. That's it. And also, because he was created, he was liable um, to change or alteration. The, the ancients were very strong. If something, you know, God, God doesn't change, but it, everything outside God can change. Can change. And though the Son of God, the Word of God, always remained obedient to the Father, uh, he need not have done. And it was this Word or Son who became incarnate and died and rose and is our Saviour. He believed all that. But the question was, who was he? What was he? And he, he wouldn't have been happy with saying that he was God in the, the true and full sense. Now it has been said that Arius' um, great intention was to uphold the, the, the primacy, if you like, of the Father, the Godhead of the Father. He wanted to, to uphold that, that the Father is God. And, and therefore, the Son can't be God in the same sense. And if you're going to talk about the Son being begotten, well, that begotten, I mean, that's a, a rather messy thing that human beings get up to and not really incompatible with Godhead. Now, you, you can imagine all the discussion, scholarly discussion and controversy that is about, you know, where Arius got his ideas from uh, and what, what he was really driving at and why he said what he said and so forth. Huge amounts of controversy over that. But that's more or less what he said. Our difficulty is that we don't have much of his own writing, as I mentioned. So we only hear about him from people who had it in for him. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, now, Arianism, what, what, we'll come to this, but Arianism was, was condemned, if you like, outlawed at the Council of Nicaea. Arius died in 336. The, uh, and what happened was that the council came out against Arius and everybody said fine that's it and then Constantine began to think oh I wonder if we got it quite right and, and, and everybody was getting het up basically in a whole different positions and Arius was just about to be reinstated uh, and uh, by, by um, some of his friends and by another council uh, but uh, dropped dead before it happened, suddenly. That was in 336. But Arianism outlived Arius. And um, some people say there's quite a lot of it among the theologians in Oxford University to this day. But uh, they, it outlived, it outlived uh, Arius by a long time, good 200 years, there were still Arians around. Uh, a lot of the people to the north outside the Roman Empire, the Goths, were evangelized by Arian missionaries and therefore were converted to Arianism, Arian form of Christianity, and only became 
Catholic Christians later. That's true in Spain, for example, where the, uh, the Visigoths were originally Aryan and then only converted, I think it was in the year 563, when their king said, no, we're going to become Catholics rather than Aryans. But Arianism uh, went on, and it's remained in, in, if you like, the memory of the church as a kind of archetypal heresy, and in a certain sense, the prime heresy. Now, we'll, we'll go into sort of why a bit more in, in, in a minute. Uh, and the great champion of orthodoxy was Saint Athanasius, as we know, who was only a deacon, at the, well, sorry, I shouldn't say only a deacon, was a deacon at the council and later became Archbishop of Alexandria and uh, suffered much in, in the uh, upholding of orthodoxy and took a very strong line against Arius and all those who were of his party. Now, the council responded to Arius by promulgating a creed. And now I'll give you uh, a copy of this. It's basically very familiar. Now, but not all of it. Yeah, there we are. And, uh, there we are. Can you pass those down? Thank you. Four, five, uh, one, two, three, sorry, sorry, two more. Good. Two, three, okay. Okay. Surplus. Thank you. Um, now, the Yes, as I say at the top there, they, they decided, the, the, the bishops at the Council of Nicaea decided to come out with, promulgate a creed which would make it quite clear that the views of Arius were not those of the church. And so they did that by taking a pre-existing creed, probably that used in the church in Jerusalem, and then added some phrases to it, and then added some anathemas. An anathema is, strictly speaking, a, a curse, actually, of, um, on those who hold wrong opinions. So um, between the asterisks, as an asterisk said, that, that's the creed of the Council of Nicaea, and I've put what the Council added in uh, italics. So you see, it begins off, it's very familiar, is it not? Yeah, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And then in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, generated from the Father, and then this, that is from the being of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial, which is homousios, or homousion, with the Father. And then the rest is all fairly familiar. And then the last line, and in the Holy Spirit. And then these anath anathemas. So we'll just have a look at that. Now, creeds were used um, as we still use them in, in baptism, obviously, weren't they? So when someone becomes a Christian, they, they profess their faith and do you believe? Did I you ask these questions? We do it again at the Easter Vigil and so on. Um, but the council, did, the council was going to use the creed in a new way as an expression of the teaching of the whole church. Now, the essential point that's being made by the, the additions, the italics, and the, and the anathemas at the end, is that in his divine nature, Christ is, is co-eternal, right? Co-eternal. And therefore, co-equal with the Father. So, uh, the, there was a theology teacher who used to say, 
There never was a was when he wasn't. There never was a was when he wasn't. There never was a time when he wasn't. This, is, this was Arius' big slip. That, that there was a time when he was not. That's what Arius said. And the church said, no, we, that's not what we believe. There never was a time when he wasn't. There never was a was when he wasn't. Um, and so he's, he's co-eternal and co-equal. The Father and I are one. So he is divine in the same sense as the Father is. He, he's not a second God. He's not a lesser God. He's not a metaphorical God. He is truly divine. So... He is from the being of the Father, from the being of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. I mean, these are hammer blows. You know, this is really trying to bash this thing uh, forever. You know, it's not enough to say God from God, but true God from true God. Um, because... Um, what is it? That, that's a, uh, a reference to John chapter 17. Eternal life is this, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Aries said, ha ha, there you are, you see. The Father is the only true God. Eternal life is to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So the council said, uh, uh, f okay, fine, the Father is called true God there, but because the Son comes from the, has the very being of the Father, he is true God from true God, and light from light. And begotten, whatever that may mean, begotten, but not made, not created. And then this famous consubstantial, as we say again now, uh, with the Father. So what did it mean, this homoousios? This became uh, a, a huge point of conflict, one of these sort of loaded words that you are either for it or against it. And you're either a homoousion or you're something else. Um, and it means of the same nature, of the same stuff, really. The same stuff as the Father. They're the same thing. And eventually this would lead to the teaching that God is three persons sharing one nature. Three who's and one what. That's the way, best way. A person is a who and a nature is what. So, you know, each of us has our own name, each of us is a person, and each of us has human nature. Yeah, where a who and a what. Yes. Uh, in that case, I would have a question because we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds on. Would I have put him slightly below? And the second uh, question is the fact that we in the West have the filioque, which. Uh, yes, I won't go into the filioque. No, 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 no. It, just, it, it fits in the conversation because if you, if you yeah. say that the Father and the well, Son. Yes, it does fit in, yes. Yes. If you say that the Holy Spirit also from the Father, you must also from the Son. Yes. Yes. Well, that's what. Yes, that's what uh, the Orthodox don't seem to be able to say. But that's why the the, the filioque the the is 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 anti-Arian. It's a way of saying that the Father, the the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Therefore, it must proceed. Uh, from the Son as well, because the Father and the Son are equal, without taking away from the fact that he proceeds originally, as it were, from the Father, because the Father is always the origin. The Father always comes first, not in time, but in dignity, as it were. Um, is, that, is that the answer? Is that an answer or not quite? All right. Um, now, when, when a human father begets a son, his son comes after him in time, obviously. But God is outside time and is eternal. And so the Orthodox people would say, well, if 
God was eternally Father. There, was, there never was a time when God could not be called Father. He doesn't just become Father in relation to us. He is the Father from all eternity. Well, if he's the Father, he must have a Son from all eternity. Otherwise, he became Father, and therefore he wasn't the Father at some point, until the Son came along, as it were, um, to put it rather crudely. Um, now, Arius could not distinguish be being between being begotten in eternity and being created in time. This, this, he just wasn't clear on that. But the council did. So, it makes very clear that there is a line between what is divine and what is not divine, the created. And that the sun, this is a simple thing really. It's really a question of what side of the line does the sun belong? If, if there is a line, and Arius was a bit, it was a bit sort of wobbly, but, but Arius was very keen, well the father is the, the divine side of the line and everything else is the created side. And whereas the Council of Nicaea says, no, the Father and the Son are both the divine side of the line. And then the next Council will say, and the Holy Spirit too. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit belong, if you like, to the order of divinity, and all else belongs to creation. So he's not a second God, but he's one with the only God. So whatever the, whatever the Father is, he is. Except for being the Father, because he proceeds from the Father, he's begotten by the Father. But everything else, so he is light from light. If the Father is, is light, he is light. If the Father is true God, he is true God, and so forth. Um, now, is that more or less clear? Is that more or less clear? Yeah. Now, the, the, you, you may wonder, well, it, you know, does that got anything to do with my own spiritual life or life of the church or anything? Is, it, is this in any way of any significance, really, or is it just battles long ago? Um, well, actually, the, the church learned a great deal through the experience of the Council of Nicaea. I mean, you, it, sort of the church, I suppose this is always true, church learns by doing something. She, she sort of realizes, well, this is the right thing to do in a particular set of circumstances, so we'll do this. And then only later does the full significance of that uh, emerge. And so the, the, the Council of Nicaea, the church learned a lot through the Council of Nicaea. She, most of all, this, she became crystal clear about this business of Christ's divinity, but I'll come back to that at the end. So, first of all, uh, she became aware that creeds were not simply personal statements of baptismal f faith, but corporate profession, professions which serve to unite the church. You know, uh, sometimes creeds are called symbols. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but sometimes it's called the the, the, um, the symbol of the apostles, the creed of the apostles. And a symbol originally was, it was, um, well it's almost actually, if you, if you took a credit card and you cut a credit card in two and you gave one, one half to, one person had one half and one person had the other, and then, and you made a deal with this person and you knew that this was the person you made the deal with when you put the two halves together and they met. So that a, symb a symbol was ac ac actually a sign of so was something that unites you. A symbol. So you, you, would, you would, if you were making a deal or a contract with somebody, you'd, you'd have half of the piece of paper and the other person would have half the piece of paper and it would be jagged and the two things would come together. And so a, a, a creed was, is meant to unite us, really, yes. And so, so the, the, the church discovered, as it were, this new 
this unitive purpose of the creeds, she became aware of her power to make dogmatic definitions uh, binding on all. So became aware of her teaching authority. And also, there's not just this creed in the Council of Nicaea. There are various canons. Um, so there's the beginnings of universal canon law there as well. So that was it. Now, another thing that the church learned, and this is, this is still quite a significant point, is that she could use language that isn't strictly biblical to defend a truth which is biblical. So, this great word, consubstantial homoousios, of the same substance, was coined. Now, you won't find that in the Bible. People say, well, that's a very Greek word, and so on. But the truth it is trying to defend is the, the, a truth that is part of Revelation and belongs to Scripture. And it's the beginning, if you like, of a certain technical theological language, or common theological language which the church has elaborated. Can you think of another word? Consubstantial might make you think of it. Yes, exactly. Transubstantiation would be another one. And, and so o over, the, over the centuries the, the church has used words and developed an, a language of her own to express her faith in. And sometimes it's not immediately comprehensible. Sometimes it needs explanation. Uh, and some people say, wouldn't it be lovely if we could all just be simple and use words that everybody uh, uh, understood? Well, we, we try to do that, but in any area of human life, there are, you might say, technical specialized vocabulary. I mean, think of all the vocabulary we've all had to learn with, to do with computers. It's all these, all these words, you know, downloading and things like that. <laughs> but much more, <laughs> you know, in, internet providers and things like this. And when you first enter this whole world, like you haven't a clue what people are talking about. You know, people say, oh, you've got, you better change your internet provider. And say, well, I didn't know I had one, you know, and all of that. But that, uh, anyway, the, 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 this is, the, the church realized that she needed to, as it were, elaborate uh, uh, her own language. And, and it shouldn't be lightly set aside. We might find, as time goes on, a better way of putting it. Yeah. But we don't, we shouldn't, there's, no, there's, there's nothing wrong in this, surely. Nothing wrong, it's natural. Now also, and this, I hope this isn't, she also became more aware of the analogical nature of our language about God. Uh, meaning, for example, this whole business of begetting. Begetting. The father begets the son. Well, now that's obviously an analogy drawn from human reproduction. Okay. And if you're applying it to God, well, it seems we can apply it to God because this, this word, begetting, is in Scripture and it's in the tradition. He's the only begotten son. I mean, the very word son and father. These are, these are human terms. When you're dealing with begetting and you're applying it to God, you've got to put aside the question of time, as I said, right? Humanly speaking, you can only start to beget when you've reached a certain age. And you've got to put aside the physical, because God is not physical. So if there is a begetting in God's part, it's not time-bound, and it's not, if you like, body-bound. It's a spiritual process. So we are using the term analogically. There is something in common between human begetting and divine begetting, but there's also a difference. And this goes for everything we say about God. 
even, you know, we glibly say, well, God is good. But, but our, our knowledge of goodness is drawn from human life. So we would have to say, if you're going to be strictly orthodox, that, that God is, is not good in the, the sense that we understand good. He is good in our sense, but, he, but it's only an analogy. And so his goodness is of a different order. So one of the later councils says, there is always a greater unlikeness than a likeness in any language we use of God. So God's goodness is, there, there really is a connection between God's goodness and our goodness, but God's goodness at the same time infinitely transcends our idea of goodness. So if we say God is just, God is love, God is, God is merciful, so on. All, all our language, uh, yeah, um, so that. Now, she also, this, this is also, and I've touched on this, we're getting to the Grand Slam in a minute, that's it. But anyway, she, <laughs> she became clearer that about this clear line between the uncreated and the created. Now, in the, in the world of that time, I don't know if we've gone back to this rather, but I think in the, in the, the mental climate, um, the philosophical culture and the popular culture of the time, the, there wasn't a clear distinction between what was divine and what wasn't. It was all on a spectrum. It's a bit new agey, really. It's all, it's all reality is one great big blob. And there's a sort of more divine and spiritual end, and there's a more material and less divine end. But it's all basically one great soup, in a sense. One great thing. And b because, well, thanks to divine revelation and so on, and thanks to this particular controversy, uh, the, the distinction between the uncreated and the create, created became much clearer. Um, and this meant, this means, if you like, that God is free to be God and creation is free to be creation. And so it meant that creation was de divinized, desacralized, and, and therefore the many serious historians of thought will say that the development of science and technology as we know it one of the conditions of its possibility was this very clear distinction that Christianity uh, clarified between the divine and the non-divine do you get that so that so that because if if because then in a certain sense, it would go back to the first chapter of Genesis, we are the people who have responsibility for the world. We can investigate the nature of reality, of the material world, for example, and use it. We can research it and use it. It's not something so sacred that we can't touch it. It's not that we're going to, that God is going to jump out on us and slap, slap. <laughs> It's on the wrist, you know, if we sort of look at a tree a bit too closely, uh, he might jump out of it. Um, now, the, 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 the danger is, of course, that is that one, if humanity then, if humanity, I mean, this is one way of reading the development of Western history. If, if, if humanity um, then realizes that, in a certain sense, creation belongs to us, and then forgets the connection with God, our own responsibility towards God and the immediate connection that the whole of creation has with God, then we will start to abuse creation and we will, and hence you end up with ecological disasters of human making. But that's an abuse of something which of itself is legitimate and it became much easier to be scientific about the world once 
you, you had seen that it, it wasn't God, it was created by God. Yes. Or all of this. Yes. 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 You lose your fear of these things. Uh, no, I mean that—that's a terribly hop, skip, and jump view of the whole process, and it's—it's uh, it's all much more complex than that. But there's there's something that is there is a link between between the clarity or between the, the Judeo-Christian view of the distinction between creation and, and the creator, which has enabled the development of science. I think that's a tenable thesis anyway. Okay. But most of all, the church became still clearer, crystal clear indeed, as to the divinity of her saviour. So it's almost like you could say the Council of Nicaea, it's like St. Thomas at the end of the Gospel of John, my Lord and my God. You know, put your hand here, my Lord and my God. And now it, it's true that when you repel a heresy, there's always a danger of so emphasizing the truth contrary to the heresy that you lose your balance. Um, so it's fine, it's great to be gung-ho, if you like, for our Lord's divinity, um, but we mustn't forget that he's also became man, right? Uh, that, and we mustn't forget that he's always the son of God, so the one who, while equal to the Father, comes from him and refers himself, us to him. So when he taught us to pray, he, he didn't teach, teach the Jesus prayer, <laughs> he taught the Our Father, he taught us to pray to the Our Father, so that he's always the Son, he is always the Son. But as long as we keep those balances in mind, we, in, in a certain sense we can't overemphasize the truth of our Lord's divinity, because this is um, actually at the heart of our faith. That the whole of our faith is built upon this proposition that he is God from God and light from light, true God from true God, really. Without that, Christianity isn't really worth bothering about. Because it, without that, Jesus just becomes another interesting religious figure in the history of mankind. Who maybe said some striking things, did some striking things, came to an unhappy end, uh, and so forth, uh, but um, is no more than that. So he's not just someone in whom God's light shines with special brightness, if you like. Uh, he is God. He is light. And for, for St. Athanasius, who, who um, you know, made it his life's work really to <laughs> oppose Arianism, that the whole of Christianity was at stake here. So he's always saying the Son of God became the Son of men, man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. Apologies for the non-inclusive version there, but it goes much better if you say it like that. Um, so only God can rescue us from sin and death and unite us to himself. So only God can deify us. He says if, 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 if it's our vocation to become God-like, then only God can do that. And there, and, but it's Christ who does it, ergo, therefore, Christ must be God. Um, and so only or only the Son, someone who is the Son of God in the full sense, can make us sons and daughters of God. So Jesus prays, I pray that they may be one with us, Father, as you, as you Father, are in me and I in you. 
or maybe one in them, that they may be one as you, Father, are. Or they may be in, <laughs> what, is, what is it he says, I've forgotten. <laughs> but uh, that they may be, that they may be, yeah, as I am in you, yes. Uh, and for St. Cyril of Alexandria, a little later, it would be the Eucharist where all this hits home. Because if, if, you know, if, if, if Jesus was just as Arius envisaged, we'd be uh, eating the body of this God with a small g. You might wonder, what, what's the point? What's the point? But if, in a sacramental way, we're eating the body of Christ, it's human body, yes, but if Christ is the Son of God, in the full sense, then we are communing with God when we receive the Eucharist. When we pray to Christ, we are praying to God immediately. That's rather important. So we've got nowhere further to go, really. That, that, so it, it is you know, it is relevant to our own spiritual life. If you take it away, the whole, the whole, ho the whole house collapses, actually. And if you think of the Christian life and all the dedication it requires, Jesus says, you know, unless you hate, you know, unless you hate your, 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 your mother and father, all of this stuff, uh, and, you know, unless you're, you're, you give up all your possessions or you lay down your life, I mean, how can anybody say that unless they are God? It's an outrageous thing for any, for any human be mere human being to say, or even this sort of demigod of Arius. And it's not a coincidence that the Council of Nicaea coincided with the upsurge of monastic life. Because the, the, the religious life and the renunciations it involves only make sense on the basis of the divinity of Christ. Oh, I think that's true. St. Benedict says, prefer nothing to the love of Christ. Well, that presupposes his divinity. Prefer nothing. Couldn't really say that about anybody else. You know, we may love someone a lot and, and you know, in, in, in one sense, you know, a husband should prefer nothing to his wife, and a wife should prefer nothing to the husband, but not quite in the same sense. <laughs> so, so, so that. So out of our awareness of the Christ divinity springs the Christian life in general, and the religious life in particular, I think. That's one reason why the religious life is important, because it, it, it is actually incomprehensible without, without the divinity of Christ. And you'll say, well, there are Buddhist monks, aren't there? Yeah, I don't know, I can't think of the answer of that straight off, but there it is. So, um, this council was, I haven't touched on the other things, but I won't, but the, the, this council was hugely significant. We can be very grateful for it, in that sense, that it, that it is made so clear, put into the creed, and then... Um, with a few mutations that becomes the creed that we say every Sunday and we say that after we've heard the readings so that, that the creed is in a way helps us understand the readings and before we're going to celebrate the Eucharist itself some significance in that in that placing so there we are you've done very well keeping awake you've done <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.